In this uh, presentation with a very humble title, I will uh, talk about uh, this problem. Uh, you can go very fast with storage uh, with Linux, but you may have accidents. Um, and uh, this happens because uh, Linux in its default configuration basically uh, performs very little or no control on I.O. For this reason, uh, uh, Linux has been equipped with um, mechanisms to control I.O. Uh, the first of which has been implemented by someone who is here, <laughs> and, that, and it is throttling. Um, throttling is still, as far as I know, the most used mechanism for controlling I.O. in Linux. Uh, but it has a problem. Uh, uh, throttling has not been designed keeping um, throughput in mind. It is not designed to, to keep the throughput high. For this reason, uh, a sort of uh, extension of throttling has been um, uh, devised that's called low limits. And uh, the goal of these low limits is to um, control I.O. Uh, while keeping throughput high. Unfortunately, as I'm about to show you in this presentation, um, this works with uh, purely random I.O. Just random reads, it's perfect. You get 100% of the speed of your device. But if you have a heterogeneous workload, like for example sequential plus random, then you throw away almost all the speed of your storage device. Around 80% just thrown away. And uh, fortunately, uh, there seems to be now a solution to get back this speed and this, this uh, BFQ IO scheduler. Um, the, with BFQ, you get back 90 to 100% of the speed, also in those problematic uh, uh, workloads, also with those problematic workloads. And uh, you also keep full control on IO. So uh, after this part of advertising <laughs> for VFQ, of course, VFQ is not perfect. And I will tell you in, in the end that there are drawbacks also with VFQ. Um, this presentation is basically made of two parts, one about personal systems, the other about self. So I'll try to show you this problem and this possible solution in two cases. So let's start with speed, uh, block and queue, the new um, IO stack of uh, Linux, the new parallel IO stack of Linux, in which you have uh, uh, one uh, independent queue uh, for each core of your CPUs. Um, in this case, you, um, um, IO requests are inserted and instructed to then to be dispatched to the, your storage device. And these queues are manipulated independently uh, of each other, so in parallel. Um, if your device also has multiple queues, and this happens with new NVMe devices, then uh, block and queue can also handle those queues, and also in that case, independently uh, of each other. So maximum parallelism, which means basically maximum speed. I have highlighted a slot here in uh, the block and queue scheme for components called IO schedulers, and I will talk about them um, in a moment. So uh, in all this presentation, I will use as a reference a real uh, system uh, containing basically a storage, this SSD, which is now just an average SSD with that speed there, 500 megabytes per second, and uh, around uh, 70 uh, kilo IOPS in case of random read. And, uh, but this device is mounted in, on um, no, now old laptop of mine, it was a workstation, mobile workstation, that thick but there. So uh, for, uh, that, for this uh, PC, that device there is a fast device. So it's a challenge to uh, push it to the maximum, to, to a very high speed. But block and queue makes it. Um, because um, I run this test as an example with uh, buffered synchronous random reads, and this is how can I say, the um, hardest the, uh, workload for which it is most difficult for the system to reach a high throughput. 
because it's buffered, so you go through the patch cache and you get all the overhead of the patch cache. It's synchronous, so every process just issues one request and then waits for the completion of that request before issuing the new one, so you pay every over all the overhead for every request. And, uh, and then, yeah, and then it's random, so it's the case uh, for which you get the lowest throughput. And uh, also in this case, uh, on that PC, you still get uh, 50 kilo IOPS, which is a high throughput. So block and queue is efficient, and we go uh, very fast. So yeah, we have a lot of speed. Let's use it. Let's, uh, what uh, mm, would we like to use this speed for? For example, on a personal system, to start our applications very quickly, to open files quickly, to save files quickly, and any other interactive task you can think of. Or maybe to play back uh, audio, video uh, smoothly, even if maybe something else is happening in our system and so on. So this is for a personal system. In case of a server, probably uh, one would like to use all this speed to give a high bandwidth to every uh, client of the server, whatever the service is, video streaming, web, uh, cloud storage, whatever you want or maybe to uh, different containers or virtual machine or in general to any entity that is competing uh, for the storage um, for on, on that system, that machine. Uh, for brevity, from now on, uh, I will only mention clients, uh, meaning any entity that you can imagine that is competing. Okay, so first part of this presentation, personal system. And I/O scheduler, as I said before, there is that slot there for these I/O schedulers. They are there uh, to decide the order in which these I/O requests are dispatched to uh, storage. Why is it uh, needed? Is it useful to decide this order? Well, to provide, to guarantee um, a certain um, number of useful service properties, uh, such as low latency. Um, responsiveness, which means low latency for interactive tasks, uh, fairness among processes doing I.O., and, and so on. In block and queue, the set of uh, um, I.O. scheduler is that one. So there is now finally BFQ, and uh, um, then you have MQ deadline known, which basically does nothing as the name says, and uh, um, Kyber. So, uh, are these I.O. scheduler good at directing this I.O. traffic? I want to show it to you uh, with a demo. This is a recorded demo. It's um, an old demo uh, recorded uh, with an old version uh, of uh, the kernel. Um, the, at any rate, uh, sorry. The um, results uh, shown here hold also uh, with the uh, block and queue, so with current uh, version of the kernel, and I'm about to show this to you through a diagram. Uh, as for this demo, um, this demo is made of three parts. I will show you only the first part about responsiveness. And responsiveness will be measured by just measuring the time to start a large uh, application. And in this case, it was a LibreOffice writer. Uh, so you will see in a moment a large window um, in which uh, this application will be started repeatedly. And every time, uh, in the time that it takes to start will be measured and reported. At the beginning, the application will be started with nothing in the background, no other I.O. in the background to have a reference uh, value for the startup time. Then I will uh, start adding some uh, I.O. in the background to see what happens, if there is a little bit more uh, I.O. Here you can see uh, the current I.O. scheduler. These are the scheduler for legacy block, because it's old version of the kernel. There was only lega the legacy block layer, and there were only these schedulers here. Um, CFQ, um, let me just stop this one second, because I forgot to introduce these schedulers here. Uh, CFQ uh, is the most accurate scheduler available in legacy block. Then there is deadline, which is basically identical to MQ deadline in block and queue. NOP, which is more or less the counterpart of known in, uh, in block and queue. 
uh, and then uh, BFQ, which was not there, which is available only out of three for legacy for the legacy block layer because it never made it into uh, mainline uh, for legacy for the legacy block layer. Okay, I think I told you almost everything. Here there is a monitor for the throughput, but we won't focus on that, and I won't focus on that in this presentation. Okay, so this application starts in about 0 0.6 seconds when there is nothing else in the uh, background, but now we start just the reading of one file, synchronous sequential reading of one large file. It's not a lot of I.O. because it's synchronous, so one request at a time. The current I.O. scheduler is CFQ, and we are about to see what happens if we just read one file. It happens that we wait for a lot of time. This is the, the first bad news. And this is mainly the reason why, one of the reasons why CFQ is not used much any longer for flash storage. Because if you switch to knob, so you do nothing, you just step aside, then it's better. And it, the time becomes about twice as the time that you got when the device was idle. Uh, the same result with deadline in a moment. So if you have uh, just the reading of one file, the time to start the application already doubles. This is not a lot of AO, really not. So. Um, we will try now by just adding the reading of another file. A little bit more of a yo with no writes, which was the, the real enemy. So just the reading of two files in a moment, and you will see that the startup time will grow. And if I remember well, it be, will become like four times as high as when the device was idle. So you start to, to wait, start to wait. If you switch back, to CFQ, this is the time for your first coffee break, because, yeah, yeah. So actually, CFQ is basically, with flash storage, people tend not to use it any longer. Uh, OK, so this, is was, this was just to show you, to try to convince you that there is a problem. So this schedule are not working so well. And this was the motivation, this was the reason why a lot of years ago uh, I made uh, BFQ uh, with, with Fabio, Fabio Cecconi. Actually, he implemented it. The very first version was implemented by Fabio. And uh, one of the goals was exactly to recover responsiveness because it was so, <laughs> I don't know, um, unbearable that you had your system with even very fast storage and then if it was just uh, copying a file, <laughs> it became unresponsive. It was so <laughs> crazy. So um, with BFQ, the, the goal was to recover this responsiveness. Um, in Android terminology, it's called le leg is the usual term to indicate responsiveness with the opposite meaning, high responsiveness, low leg. Um, another goal was to have a low drop rate in video and audio playback. I won't show you that in this presentation. High throughput and so on. Um, as in the demo that I just showed you, you can find the need for these features uh, uh, reported in many diagrams, presentations, articles, scientific paper, whatever you want, a lot of demos. One of these demos is, is the one I'm, I'm showing you uh, right now. So there are demos for uh, several type of devices. M my phone, before my kid broke it, uh, uh, the high key with both Android and Debian, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's see whether it's true that uh, with BFQ, this problem gets uh, at least mitigated. So we go on with this demo. I remind you that this is an old uh, Linux version, so a very old BFQ version, and the performance of BFQ now is much better, and I'll show it to you with the next diagram. So why I'm showing you this demo before the, the diagram? Because uh, I wanted to let you feel what those numbers actually mean for a human being using <laughs> that PC. So going on with this demo, I'm about to switch to BFQ in a moment to <laughs> finally let LibreOffice start, otherwise it will go on basically forever. So as uh, we switch to BFQ, it starts immediately. Then there are some fluctuations because of the switch. And after this first fluctuation, uh, the 
uh, startup time should be around uh, uh, two, uh, 0 0.2 seconds more than when the system was idle, which means that basically you, you just don't notice anything. You just don't notice that there is something in the background. But let's make the game much harder and move to 10 readers in parallel. Even with 10 readers in parallel, with BFQ, you, you have about twice the idle starter time. But now the performance is much, much better than that. And just as counterproof, if we reach back to deadline, you can have your second coffee break because it becomes like 10 seconds, if I remember well, something like that. You wait. OK. OK, so this is all for the first thing that I wanted to show you. And uh, as I already said, um, now we are in the block and queue uh, epoch or era, I don't know. Uh, and these are the results. Uh, this is another um, common application, num terminal. On the y axis, the time to start the application. On the x axis, two of the nastiest workloads for responsiveness. Ten readers in sequential readers in parallel. Five readers plus five writers in parallel. Sequential in both cases, because the key here is sequential. Because sequential I/O is the I/O that both the uh, operating system, the, the I.O. stack, and the drive like most. They like it because that's the I.O. that pushes the throughput to the maximum possible uh, value, and because of other reasons that merging and so on. So this is the nastiest uh, kind of workload that you can have um, in your system, on your system. Uh, the red line is the reference value, that is how long the application takes to start if there is nothing going on in the system. And as you can see with BFQ, <laughs> the time is the same, even if you have the readers in parallel. And a little bit more if you have also writes, but for, I mean, it's, it's hard even to realize that it is more. And the story is rather different with any of the other scheduler. You really wait. And now, with my demo, you I mean, you know what it means to wait uh, uh, five seconds instead of waiting nothing. OK, so this is all for personal system. As for servers, same uh, uh, quick test to see whether we still drive very fast, and we do. Uh, the, in this case, four, five clients in, in total, uh, four doing sequential reads, one doing random reads. There is a motivation behind this specific choice of the uh, workload. The, Probably I will tell you later. Uh, so it, it's just a simple, uh, rather small workloads, but it is enough to show you the problems that I want to show you. If you in, um, increase the workload, problems get worse. At any rate, we are still very fast. We are close to the peak rate of the device. Mm. But what about control? And uh, again, I have the demo also locally. I want to show you directly this. Uh, what happens if you serve that workload without any control, which is the default uh, Linux uh, configuration. Uh, here you see the name group instead of client, just because this demo is already about the solution. And the solution is encapsulating every client in a group and then controlling the bandwidth for, for the group. That's so basically, their group means uh, client. Uh, so let's see what happens. Let's do this for real. You will see. Uh, okay, uh, the, the workload starts. Uh, there is to wait a little bit uh, for uh, everything to settle down. Uh, then you will see two progress bars, one on the left and the other one on the right hand side. In this bar on the left, you will see the total number of bytes read, while on the right, it's the bytes read by the alikes group, the one doing random IO. The scales differ. This scale here is much lar larger. Nevertheless, you can see that a lot of bytes are read, but for the Alakis group, almost nothing. It's basically choked. Uh, it's less than 0.3% of the total troop, starvation. So it looks like <laughs> it's better to have control, as somebody here realized a few years ago. Um, and. Let me go back here. 
we have had what I said to you before, an accident. We need control. Um, why an accident in this case? Because without control, we had contention in that case, sequential against the random one. Without control, the system, operating system and drives can choose freely what to sell. And the system and the drives do choose the sequential I.O. So the random I.O. just waits. Um, the solution to control I.O. Uh, are I.O. policies, basically, because I.O. schedulers are not enough. They try to do the right thing automatically, but for some goals, they, this is not enough. One of the cases is exactly this one. Um, so, um, the uh, I.O. policies are basically throttling and proportional uh, share. There is something new now, but I don't have time to so I'll stick only to these two ones here. Um, throttling is an independent mechanism. It just throttles uh, the I.O. of the group that you want to, to throttle. Uh, while proportional share is basically a sort of interface and it expects some I.O. scheduler beneath it to actually do the work, to actually do the enforcement of, of the policy. In proportional share, you basically assign a weight to every to each group and the policy tries to give uh, an amount of bandwidth proportional to that weight uh, to the group um, what else the um, actually i'll show you an extension of throttling let's let's call it this way which is low limits it's an extension in which you don't throttle um, um, statically uh, groups from above but you try to ask to the policy, please try to guarantee a minimum bandwidth to every group. You decide how to throttle every group so that every group gets at least the bandwidth that I'm asking for. Um, as for the proportional share policy, uh, this is implemented by BFQ in Block NQ, but nobody uses it. I have <laughs> very simple proof <laughs> of it. I had a very simple uh, but <laughs> clear evidence of it yesterday because there is an enormous bug in BFQ and if you activate <laughs> the proportional share support in BFQ, your system just crashes. So <laughs> since <laughs> nobody complained apart someone who is trying it, uh, probably <laughs> nobody is using it. So what are people using? They're using throttling. That's the main solution used, and I want to show you how good throttling is in its incarnation uh, with uh, low limits, as I told you. Uh, so um, the demo goes on showing a throttling a proportional share, both configured to guarantee at least 10 megabytes per second to the unluckiest group, the one doing random I.O. 10 megabytes because that's the best that the low limits uh, uh, can do. To have an idea of how good they are, I uh, will compare them with a simulated ideal policy, simulated, that reaches the maximum possible throughput that can be reached while guaranteeing 10 megabytes per second to the unluckiest group. That's purely simulated, so you have an idea. In this video, there is also BFQ in the middle, but I'm about to use a powerful technology to not show you the performance of BFQ. Uh, no? Okay, it should work. Um, okay, so uh, as before, and in the top window, uh, we have uh, a low limits uh, and known as IO scheduler. The result is exactly the same if you use deadline or Kyber. In the bottom window, the ideal policy, reaching the maximum possible throughput and uh, guaranteeing 10 megabytes per second to the unluckiest group. As you can see, low limits works because the unluckiest group is getting 10 megabytes per second. The problem is on the left, top left. Th th that one is real. This is simulated. <laughs> that one is really happened on my PC. Okay. OK, I think we don't need to go on <laughs> for the full time. I hope I made my point. Um, so you, 
if, if you check, 80% uh, of, of the speed has been thrown away. So just like driving a, a, a drive that is about five times as low. Is this unsolvable? Let me unveil <laughs> the, <laughs> the hidden uh, window here. Uh, with, so same thing with the BFQ. And uh, you're about to see the result. The uh, total throughput is the same as for, it's not exactly the same, but it's extremely close to the ideal policy. And 10 megabytes per second are guaranteed to the Allakis group. And also in this case, I don't need to wait to make you wait for all the time. Uh, so yeah, uh, we, we have both speed and control back and a little homage to. Um, so is, is VFQ uh, perfect? No. Um, the main limitation of VFQ is its overhead. Uh, and because of this overhead, in the worst scenario for BFQ, there is a loss around 10 to 15 percent of throughput. The worst scenario is, again, random synchronous I.O. Because for every single I.O. request, you pay the price of executing the whole BFQ. So that's the case where the overhead of BFQ inflates uh, the duration, the processing of every request, uh, every request um, as much as possible. Uh, and another consequence of uh, this overhead is that you have a barrier for the maximum speed that, at which you can process requests. And on a commodity CPU, this barrier is around 400, 500 kilo IOPS. For the moment, uh, we are working on that, but this is the limitation uh, for the moment. And uh, that's all. Thank you. Okay, we have some minutes for questions. So yeah, it seems uh, wonderful. So if I would like to implement it tomorrow instead of let's say noob uh, today my, evening, huh? today, or today evening, oh, yeah, or, today, or now, <laughs> now. Yeah, in my distribution instead of the noob scheduler that we do use. Yeah. Uh, first question: Is it production ready? And yes. second, uh, besides the disadvantages that you've shown us, in a typical cons we do an audio operating system, so for music playback mainly. Do you foresee any potential issue there? Um, typically with uh, flash drives yes. uh, and uh, audio bandwidth. So well, uh, do you see? Um, people uh, um, doing uh, audio and video have been among the first users of BFQ because they had a lot of benefits. In the part of the demo that I didn't show, uh, there, um, that part of the demo showed the, all the issues that you have instead with the others. Yeah, of course, if you do I.O. Because in case you don't do I.O. with the storage, <laughs> you have no issues related, yeah. But if you have to do I.O. and you may happen to have some contention on your device, then you have a lot of issues with the other. Believe me, just have a look at any of those demos and, and, and you will see. With BFQ, uh, the um, case of uh, audio and video playback is exactly one of the cases where BFQ seems to provide only benefits, especially because Part of BFQ has been designed around that case. There is a, a section of BFQ uh, that covers something that I called, of course, soft real-time application. It's dedicated to them and does, tries to always schedule things the right way for a soft real-time application, like video or audio playback. Yeah. Four point twelve, you said. Yes, right? that's the beginning. But in uh, four point 
uh, 12, it was still rather bad. Actually, Block NQ itself had a lot of issues uh, at that version of the kernel. Okay. So one option is that is, I don't know whether it works for you. I also maintain an out of three version of PFQ where I put everything I do every day. And uh, yeah, um, maybe that could be an option if you are not obliged to stick to mainline. Yeah, that you find everything like last commit yesterday. So very good. No, because you know, uh, working with embedded, sometimes you work with very old kernels. Yes, so, I, know. Yeah. I know. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, let's do it then. Well, we're not. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned in playback, so audio video playback. What yeah. about interactive, uh, like uh, low latency scenarios? Is it uh, still way to go, uh, or it, does it change in any? You you mean in, in interaction with the player? But basically, yes. I mean, uh, if you have I don't know samples, maybe uh, on your maybe disc or something, you want to play those samples like real time. Uh, playing or something that you have maybe on your yeah. disk or in your memory. Yeah. Does it help? I or? expect it to be better than the other your schedulers just because the others don't care. Mm. But BFQ is not a hard real-time scheduler. So, uh, for example, if when you try to play your sample, uh, there is other I.O. going on, well, the, the current time granularity of BFQ is around 100 milliseconds, which is probably too much for what you're thinking of. So, yeah, prob for <laughs> probably with modern SSD, 100 milliseconds is too much. The reason was that with an hard disk, you have to leave the same process there working for a while to get a reasonable throughput. Probably 100 milliseconds, as somebody has already told me, is too much and can be reduced. Mm -hmm. But as of now, I don't know. The, I expect the, uh, this, this quantity to, to float around, these 100 milliseconds here and there, and maybe it's a problem for what you're thinking of. And, uh, the other question, actually, does the file system actually matter in any way? I mean, that's another question that I get often. In my tests so far, the only case where file system matters is when you have journaling. Mm. Because if you update files, then you have these extra writes. And this is the only macroscopic things that I've seen so far. But once again, the things that I usually check are have large time uh, constants. So smaller things probably, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Paolo, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I have a question about fairness, uh, as you mentioned, control. And yeah, I was wondering, uh, because we know it's easy to control and provide fair fairness for reads, uh, because they happen in the same context uh, of the process that is generating I.O. But what about brides? Uh, usually they go in page cache. Well, uh, I, I think there is more, no more time. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but my, my question is, are there any plans in, uh, I should say in the kernel in general, not only in the scheduler, because it's not only a matter of a scheduler. It, it's not only a scheduler problem. It's more like multiple yeah. subsystems yeah. uh, that need The to only thing I can tell is that uh, there is hope <laughs> at least for responsiveness because at least when you have a storm of rights that you have already caused because you have dirtied a lot of pages and then you get your storm of rights you can still ask for example be a few but any solution is okay if you have an io scheduler that is able to detect um, interactive tasks you can at least say okay I have uh, these two kinds of I.O. in competition, the asynchronous writes and some other I.O. Maybe this other I.O. must be helped and the scheduler may tell you, no, please help it because it's an interactive task. So in that case, yes, I have already made some patches. Uh, I never found the time and the resources to turn them into some production quality. So they are still there and I don't know, for <laughs> maybe they will remain there forever. If, 
and uh, yeah, uh, outside that, I think it's very hard because the only solution is above. You must throttle the cause of the right from the beginning because after it has dirtied the page, then it is handed over to the flusher, but who is guilty for that uh, yo, the process, the flusher, and if there is only one process causing the dirting, maybe, but if two processes write on the same page, whom will you account for that? So, yeah, 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 yeah. thanks. Okay, okay, thank you again. Thank you.